My name is Matthew Schlager, staff chaplain here at Children's National. From time to time, the Chaplaincy Services Department wants to pause and recognize the hard work and dedication of various departments and programs here at Children's. July is Cleft and Craniofacial Awareness and Prevention Month. Cleft and craniofacial conditions affect thousands of infants, children, teens, and adults in the United States each year. In recognition of this, we want to acknowledge and say thank you to the members of the Cleft and Craniofacial Program here at Children's National for their dedication and service. My name is Elizabeth Benitez and I'm the Cleft and Craniofacial Coordinator here at Children's National Hospital. Here we have a large cleft team that has many providers to ensure that the kids are developing and functioning as well as possible. This includes the ENT, the audiologist, the speech and language pathologist, the plastic surgeons, hearing team, psychologist, geneticist, dentist, and orthodontist. Throughout this process, we support the kids in the multidisciplinary cleft clinic. Hi, uh, my name is Albert O, and along with my two colleagues, uh, Gary Rogers and Michael Boyajian, uh, I am one of uh, three full-time craniofacial and pediatric plastic surgeons here at Children's National Hospital. And in honor of Craniofacial and Cleft Awareness Month, uh, I've been asked to give a brief introduction to our team and what are the services that we provide. Um, the Cleft and Craniofacial team is a multidisciplinary team made up of eight to nine different specialties from around the hospital. And we have members uh, as diverse as plastic surgery to genetics to speech therapy and orthodontia. Uh, it is truly a multidisciplinary effort. Uh, we meet every week to see patients from all over the area and around the world and help treat them from prenatal to adulthood to address their cleft and craniofacial uh, anomalies. Um, I'm going to touch on two other topics or two other conditions that we commonly treat. The first one is called craniosynostosis and that is the premature fusion of the cranial sutures. Why is this important? Well, because during early infancy when the baby's brains need to grow, the early fusion of a cranial suture can lead to increased intracranial pressure, which then can cause brain damage. Along with the entire team, as well as our pediatric neurosurgeons, we have a program that's led by Dr. Gary Rogers to address these uh, patients uh, from a very early age with a uh, relatively non-invasive type of procedure, as well as being able to treat patients who are older that require the more conventional open procedure. The second uh, condition I'd like to talk about is one that's called Roban sequence, or as some people call it, Pierre Roban sequence. What is this? So Roban sequence is the clinical triad of being born with micrognathia, which then leads to glossoptosis, or falling back of the tongue into the throat, which finally leads to upper airway obstruction. And this is important because it can lead to obstructive sleep apnea. And why is obstructive sleep apnea so important? Well, we know from studies done in both adults as well as in pediatric patients that prolonged obstructive sleep apnea can lead to a number of systemic problems, including brain damage, damage to the heart, damage to the autonomic system. And so it's critical that we identify these patients early on and alleviate the cause of their obstruction. Working with our cleft and craniofacial team, as well as our wonderful neonatologists here at Children's National Hospital, We've developed a program in which we've successfully treated dozens of patients from all over the area who present with this condition. These are just two of the conditions that we as the cleft and craniofacial team at Children's National Hospital are involved with. For many of the other things that we uh, take care of, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, I, as the director of the program, am always available to speak to anyone who's interested. And we're always looking for people who also want to get involved with our team whether it be volunteers, other medical professionals, or families that like to get involved. Thank you. Mike Boyage is my name. I've been here at Children's Hospital since uh, 1983, which makes me, I think, the longer, longest tenured surgeon this hospital's ever had. Um, let me tell you a story. 
Um, a while ago, I went to a wedding of one of our patients. Um, I've known that kid since he was a, an infant. He had a cleft lip closure, a palate closure, he had nasal revision, he had a bone graft, he had orthognathic surgery to make his jaws fit. And they've been nice to this department. And I was very happy to attend. On the way up to the ceremony, I ran into him and I congratulated him as I should have. And he shook my hand and he said, you know, I'm here because of you, which I thought was a little bit more exaggerated. He said, no, he said, I never would have been here except for the things you did. And that's, I mean, that's true for all of us here in one sense or another, but, um, you know, we're not here in this business to make people beautiful necessarily, but, you know, each one of our patients ought to have the right to be normal in appearance and we do the best we can to get them as close as we can to have someone get to kindergarten without having to be blocked by socialization by the fact that they look a little different or um, to go to high school and be able to participate in things like um, dances and socialization without feeling ostracized um, to interview for a job to find someone to commit to and, uh, and, and make that union. Um, you'd like to think that those things are separate from the way people look or talk, but unfortunately that's not true. When I was a resident, someone finally sat me down and said, what is it you want to do with your life? And I realized that it really wasn't in this business to do facelifts or augmentations of normal things, but to just be able to help somebody get through this life without the burden of physical deformities with which we were born is a real privilege. A privilege to go to that wedding, a privilege to think that, you know, that we get up every morning, as, as the rest of this staff does too, and just feel like today I'm going to be a blessing to somebody. It's, uh, I'm so grateful to have this job and uh, so pleased to still be here. Most of the work in this um, cleft clinic is, is just that, dealing with people who are born with discontinuities of their facial embryology. Um, in one sense, it's pretty simple. You know, you've got a lip that hadn't come together, a palate that hadn't come together, and our job is mostly to put it together. Um, but the difference between a good cleft lip closure, the ones that parents will thank you for, and one that will pass, as it were, to have people not be able to see the asymmetry um, or the secondary deformities, that difference can be just a couple of millimeters. Um, it's, uh, it really is that kind of dimension. If we can. If we can just get things in the right place, um, we can set aside the problem that might set that kid apart. Um, anyway, we see babies when they're, when they're born or as quickly as we can after birth. Um, a lot of them are going to have feeding problems. Um, a cleft palate child, for example, can't nurse properly. Um, big problem for the mom sometimes, emotionally, but uh, simply a, a problem with really getting that kid on a track to thriving. Um, There's some guidance we can offer with that. Um, that's not so much cleft lip kids, by the way, but cleft palate kids whose suck mechanism basically has a vent in it. Um, most of our basic surgeries are done first year of life. Um, cleft lip closure, palate closure should both be done during that year. The lip is as, as early as makes sense in a palate before the child's starting to talk. I mentioned just getting the lip together is not that big a deal, but getting it right and getting the nose right. You know, dealing with the soft tissue of the lip is one thing. Getting the cartilage of the nose to approach symmetry is a different challenge altogether. Sometimes that involves um, a pre-closure procedure or other cartilage manipulation. But in the end, we're going to be judged by how close to normal, how close to symmetry 
that result approaches. And it makes all the difference. The fact of the matter is I'm happy to be here. I don't really look forward to retiring. Um, I may be forced out of here before too long, but the, the fact that I can get up in the morning and feel like there's something good I'm going to do for someone each day um, really drives that. The idea of um, recreating in uh, the golden years doesn't really appeal to me. So that, that baby I operate on today, I hope I'm going to be here down the line to um, make sure they're on the course that we intended.